Howdy howdy. Today we have the SpongeBob episodes that have been classified not super or hyper, but ultra infamous. So you'd assume these episodes must be truly abysmal, right? Uh, uh. Well, let's investigate together. This is the 10 ultra infamous SpongeBob episodes. You know what's crazy though? In the last six years, I've somehow never talked about the majority of these episodes. So we should have some fun new surprises here. Anyway, let's begin. Starting with number 10. Giant Squidward. So this is the first in the Scumbob Wiki to be called ultra infamous. What's so bad about it though? Well, we start the episode with Squidward tending his garden and he uses kelp grow to make his garden grow big. This garden fertilizer apparently also works on Patrick's ice cream and SpongeBob's shoes. Patrick steals the kelp grow and yep, we're waiting for it. After Spongy and Patrick mess around with the spray a bit, they turn Squidward into a giant. Well, at least we're given what we're promised in the title. Squidward is in fact now so huge that he can grab the two jokers with one fist. And when he chases them, he shakes the seafloor in every step. At first, I was having a hard time figuring out what people hated so much about this episode. This is a season six episode, and given how low brow and slow season six normally is, I appreciate how fast paced it is. It gets to the point. We have ourselves the giant Squidward promised in record time. This is the same season as Choir Boys, in my opinion, the slowest Squidward episode and one of the worst ever made. So I appreciate how much is actually happening here. According to the Scumbob Wiki, people hate how horrible the townspeople are in this episode. And I guess that makes sense, but to be fair, Squidward is destroying their roads and chasing after two Bikini Bottom citizens, one of which is beloved by the community for his cooking skills but it is definitely going a bit far when they plan to kill him by scooping out his eyeballs. Scoop out his eyeballs and use them as giant misshapen soccer balls! They then start attacking him with giant rakes for some reason. They even encourage him to explore his secret interest a bit more. This ought to fix him! <laughs> and hey, Squidward ain't complaining. Like Bugs Bunny doesn't mind a bit of drag, Squidward makes it work. I actually found it pretty funny that Squidward starts doing good deeds for the town to prove he's a nice giant. Take me to the top of Mount Humongous? Whee! Like, it's so random to me, it actually makes me chuckle. But then, Squidward doesn't say bless you, so they instantly turn on him. I mean, this is certainly the most nitpicky and judgy the Bikini Bottom people have ever been. My biggest complaint would be, Spongy's pretty maliciously stupid here. He wrecks Squidward's life and still calls making him a giant a kindness. This is terrible. Squidward did not like the kindness we did him. But they do try and make it up to him by giving him a giant clarinet at the end. Somehow, this brings Squidward back to normal size. Personally, I wouldn't label this episode ultra infamous myself. By the end, it's so absurd that I can't take it seriously. And number nine. The Slide Whistle Stooges. Now this, this is the real deal of bad. This is how I suspect the making of this episode went down. A SpongeBob writer happened to hear a slide whistle and they said, Oh my goodness. This is the greatest sound I've ever heard in my life. I want the slide whistle as my ringtone. I want it played at my wedding. This is so incredible. I need to share my discovery with the world. And oh boy did they. This episode will make you hate slide whistles with a passion. I was only three minutes in before I never wanted to hear another slide whistle in my life. So what happens? Squidward is chased by SpongeBob and Patrick continually as they play slide whistles. Then, relenting, Squidward plays a slide whistle. Next we get the town turning against Squidward because they're as annoyed as I am. Squiddy steals a tanker of gas, destroys the Krusty Krab, and careens the truck off a cliff. So I can't say nothing happened here, but all writing exclusively revolves around hearing the slide whistle go up and down. But enough of my opinion, what bothered other people about this episode? 
According to the Scumbob Wiki, The Bikini Bottomites were cheering with joy when they thought Squidward died. Really? How dare you? They also complained that Spongy and Patrick made fun of the patients in the hospital using slide whistles. But I don't quite agree, as it looks like the patients here are laughing along with them. If anything, they're bringing them a smile. And of course, the other big complaint was people thought the slide whistles were super annoying. And I can agree. My community mentioned this too. For example, Maggie Cactus said, I swear, slide whistle stooges is the worst. SpongeBob and Patrick endlessly annoy Squidward until he joins them. But he's the only one to get punished. They didn't like SpongeBob and Patrick acting so malicious either. In the first half, Squidward makes it very clear that he wants to be left alone and asks the duo to leave his house. But they completely ignore his request and just purposely keep chasing him. They seem to know they're bothering Squidward, but just keep doing it for the laughs of it. I mean, at least Squidward eventually starts having fun in the end. But it just feels like he relents and loses his mind. And it all results in him being unable to breathe without having a slide whistle in his throat. What? Okay, even I gotta say, that's tasteless. In my opinion, it's season 6 schlock, and well worth the title of Ultra Infamous. And number 8. All That Glitters. An ultra infamous episode from season 4? Well, surely it's better than season 6 episodes. Interestingly, instead of a Squidward torture episode here, we have a Spongebob torture episode. It all starts when Spongebob breaks his spatula, leading to a long, awkward, drawn-out cry scene. <laughs> And sadly, not the last one we see here. For a while, Spongebob is absolutely, unendingly miserable. A reminder, this is all caused by a spatula. Eventually, he sells everything he owns, including his house, to buy an as-seen-on-TV piece of garbage electric spatula. And to further add to Spongebob's misery before he can even use it, it insults him, punches him in the face, and then runs away. At this point, I'm just kind of bummed out for Spongebob. We're then given this prolonged gag of the old spatula being on life support in the hospital. Even getting a flatline when it dies. Ugh. And maybe this joke could be done well, but in this case, I just found it kind of distasteful and gross. His spatula is fine in the end, but Spongebob's misery is just extended to a painful degree. By the end, I was really bummed. The Spongebob community was pretty vocal about their dislike of this episode. On the old Scumbob wiki, some of the many issues they listed were... It's a mean-spirited torture episode. And it's a filler episode with lengthy, dragging skits. And yeah, I kind of get this. A good example is when Spongebob breaks all five of his piggy banks. Now? No. no. It feels like they're just recycling audio and visuals with a copy-paste button. Even my community mentioned this one is terrible. For example, Dark Wolf said, Bad! SpongeBob's crying gets utterly obnoxious. It's mean-spirited as hell. The spatula is a verbally abusive twit. Horrible French stereotyping. I don't like it. Interestingly, one of the points the wiki listed as a negative, I actually consider the funnier part of the episode. SpongeBob spends half the episode buck naked. Despite everyone's shock, he just doesn't seem to care. And points to the writers for sticking with this naked joke throughout the whole episode. See, this is why the only thing I think SpongeBob would do jail time for is public nudity. He does it regularly. And for seven lucky seven, Googly Artiste. Despite this one being called Ultra Infamous, I don't personally consider it quite as bad as some of the others. At least SpongeBob remains likeable and in character. He didn't have that obnoxiousness or spinelessness you might expect of, say, Season 6. So what is it that makes Googly Artiste so infamous? Well, according to the Scumball Wiki, It's boring. It's a ripoff of Artist Unknown and Patty Hype. It's Squidward Torture done wrong. What? Is there a way to do Squidward Torture right? I feel like after 23 years of Spongebob, we'd all be okay to never have a Squidward Torture episode again. Anyway, IMDB was even less kind to this episode. The cartoon Factuator said, No doubt in my mind, this is one of the most insulting episodes in the series. If you're a real artist, don't watch this crap. 
as an actual self-taught artist, this episode ticked me off to the point of disgust. 2.5 out of 10. So what happened here to make these artists so mad? Well, we start with Squidward finding Patrick and SpongeBob doing basket weaving. And when an art critic comes to observe Squidward's art, he's instead blown away by Patrick's rock with googly eyes on it. And boom, Patrick becomes a famous artist. And herein lies the problem. I've definitely seen it in the cartoons before. Some stupid abstract art will do incredibly well on the market. And whatever stupid main character we have ends up being called a genius artist. While I also personally can't see the value in a lot of abstract art, I was bored of this cliché within minutes of starting the episode. In this case, the citizens of Bikini Bottom go nuts for Patrick's googly eyes art. I just don't get the punchline of what they're trying to say. Bikini Bottom is stupid, abstract art is very interpretive, and is a sign of the top 1% having way too much disposable wealth? No, no, I'm not giving this episode that much credit. I think this is just a silly episode. Number 6. Damn. Oral Report. I know about this episode, and I think it's overhated. Sure, it's not great, but, well, let's first break down the main story. SpongeBob's been assigned to do a speaking report in front of his voting class. Our buddy is understandably nervous. Unfortunately, when Spongy is trying to practice, Patrick is at his most obnoxious here. All the poor Sponge wants to do is recite his speech. And Patrick just sits there yelling BORING and snoring loudly. He then proceeds to throw things at Spongebob to further make whatever stupid point he's trying to make. He then puts Spongy on a treadmill for some reason? Then deafens him with symbols and I'm just like, why? By the end he just starts repeatedly yelling SPEECH SPEECH. He's such a jerk, isn't he? Imagine eyes with teeth. Grace! Then SpongeBob has an astute observation. Patrick, stop! Somehow your help just isn't helping! Yes, well deducted, Spongy. Fortunately, he asks Sandy for help, and she gives him goggles that let him see people in their underwear. Only problem is, they look so silly on his stupid spongy square head. Yeah, they look alright. And on the day of the speech, even Mrs. Puff is unforgiving. Mrs. Puff, do I really have to do this? Only if you want to pass this class. And stage fright is very common, particularly for oral reports in school. The whole fiasco goes awry, and it pretty much goes exactly like you'd expect. SpongeBob going on a car rampage, and unfortunately, Mrs. Puff ending up suffering for it. She's thrown in jail again. Why don't they ever throw crabs in jail? What's with this stupid cliche of Mrs. Puff's going to jail? Throw that greedy old miser in jail. He could use a few years in there. Maybe six months will help him get over his incessant urge to rip off every single person in Bikini Bottom. But this episode is really hated on the Scumbob wiki. They were weirdly critical about every single part of this episode. These were just some of their points. Patrick is an unhelpful butt face. The pacing is weak and too much filler, like a yucky cheese filling. Oral reportitis is a nonsensical disease name. The title is misleading, and imagining people in their underwear is creepy. Oh come on, that's a very common stage fright technique I've heard since I was a kid. My variation is to imagine the audience buck naked. It makes it even funnier. On a side note, a cute thing people enjoyed about this episode is SpongeBob is constantly pointing out to his friends that forging his license is illegal. Or I could just make you a fake voting license. That's still illegal. Give me the goggles. Number five. Gone. This is really weird. I mean, I know weird is pretty normal for SpongeBob, but I just don't know what to make of this. The episode's much like the title implies. SpongeBob wakes up to find the entire town deserted. And over the next few weeks, he slowly loses his sanity. It was not only classified ultra infamous by the Scumbob Wiki, but even recommended by my community as an abysmal episode, such as Shadow Ramcat. The only one I didn't like was Gone, where like everyone in Bikini Bottom was gone, including Gary. The episode looks similar to the category of Last Man of Earth. Yeah, I have to disagree that it's anything like Last Man on Earth. Last Man on Earth was interesting to me because it was based on a post-apocalyptic world. Gone takes the most boring part of the apocalypse and gives us nothing else. There's no other people, no dialogue, no conflict, no story of destruction. There's not even any zombies. There's nothing beyond SpongeBob getting so bored that he goes insane. Though it was an interesting psychological twist to see he made a friend out of his car. I 
Guess it's just you and me now, Bodie. So why is this known as Ultra Infamous? Scumbob calls it a cruel SpongeBob torture episode. But what probably clinched it as Ultra Infamous was the final minute of the episode. In this last couple of minutes, Spongebob sees everyone return on a bus. It turns out they'd all left for National No Spongebob Day, a day where they supposedly escape Spongebob's annoyingness. Everybody needs at least one day away from- <laughs> I think Scumbob described this quite vividly. All the characters except Spongebob are unlikable and mean-spirited. They abandon him. Them burning a statue of Spongebob meant they want to kill him. Everyone didn't care about him. It was selfish of them not to bring Spongebob on the trip, just because he has flaws. Yeah, but I don't know if Spongebob would enjoy National No Spongebob. Oh my kitty, he'd still enjoy it. And I have to admit, after I saw Sandy gleefully kicking Spongebob's ashes as they burned his statue, it just felt sad and way out of character. I've seen Spongebob push Sandy before to her absolute limits in patience. But even then, she would never participate in a hate club for her best friend. Squidward and Mrs. Puffs maybe, sadly, possibly even Patrick, I could see him being that horrible. But this is nuts. Squirrel nuts. <laughs> uh. Patrick does get his comeuppance when No Patrick Day starts right after, but everyone else here just gets off scot-free. Overall, it's a tedious episode with a pretty dang stupid punchline. And what have we got for number four? You don't know, Sponge. Oh, I used to love that game. Coincidentally, my favourite one was the one with the pirates. Anyway, my first big issue with this episode was it's basically about Patrick proving what a bad friend he is. And, you know, I've been beating that dead horse on this channel for six years. They start with a best friend quiz, where Patrick can't figure out anything about Spongebob. Not even his gender. You know, I'm starting to suspect this Patrick fellow might not be too bright. Somehow, this is the event that causes Spongebob to realise that Patrick is a very bad friend, and he is beside himself with sadness. This is a breakthrough for him. Do I smell character growth? Well, respects to him, he starts to move on and speaks to his other best friend, Sandy. Maybe you and Patrick just need some time apart. Yeah, I'll have lots of fun without Patrick. Uh, hello Spongebob, why not hang out with your other best friend? She's right there, and she could probably answer everything about you from that quiz book. But no, for some reason Spongebob goes off by himself. Wanna bet he becomes friends again with Patrick? The sad part is, I felt this episode was a chance for them to say something quite profound and meaningful to viewers. It could have given Spongebob some character growth, as he realises that one of his best friends is actually a fair-weather friend. In case you don't know, a fair-weather friend is generally a friend who is dependable in good times, but nowhere to be seen in times of trouble. And Patrick is shown in many episodes to be pleasant when he and Spongebob are having fun, but absolutely useless or even malicious when everything is asked of him. But apparently, it's all okay in the end because Patrick buys him a present. <sighs> Alright, Spongebob. The Scumbob Wiki had similar complaints to me. Spongebob and Patrick falling out has been done before. I hate you, Patrick. I hate you more. This is some of the laziest writing in the series ever imaginable. Also, Patrick and Spongebob quizzing each other takes more than half the runtime, and the ending is rushed and stupid. Though on the plus side, we do discover some fun trivia here, such as Spongebob is ambidextrous, and he has an outy belly button. Not that I really needed to know that one. And next, number three. Pineapple fever. Like cabin fever, but at Spongebob's house. Get it? No! Cabin fever is basically when someone starts to drive you batty because you spend too much time in close quarters with them. And that's basically what we get here. In this episode, Squidward is stuck indoors with Spongebob and Patrick during a storm. Doesn't that sound fun? It sounds like a freaking nightmare. Wanna bet they're gonna get on Squidward's nerves? I gotta get out of here! I first realized I was around the dreaded season six when I reached a super sandbaggy scene where Spongebob drones on for nearly a minute, repeating words of what to do in a storm. Board games, and playing tic-tac-toe, and drinking hot cocoa, and playing tic-tac-toe. Followed by some of the worst flashing light scenes I've seen since Electric Soldier Polygon. 
I'm going to show you a dramatically slowed version in case you're as photosensitive as I am. Imagine this scene about five to ten times faster. It literally made me nauseous. And there were like six of these spread randomly throughout the episode. There were like nasty landmines of blinding seizure inducers I had to keep looking out for. I'm eager to see the tail end of this nightmare for Squidward, so let's see what other people thought. The Scumbob Wiki of course labeled it as ultra infamous. They had multiple reasons it drives them insane. 1. There's a lot of unnecessary filler. Lots of them wasting time playing board games and drinking cocoa. 2. There's a disturbing moment where Squidward rips his eyebrow off. Please, no more gore! Ugh. I got their feeling of frustration. Yuck. 3. Out of nowhere. All three go insane for no reason over Squidward's food. 4. The ending's bad. As if Squidward wasn't tortured enough. A tornado lifts SpongeBob's house off the ground and Squidward falls. Well, I mean, at least he's back on the ground next to his own house. Curse you, Prabloons. Sadly, the most elated emotion I felt during Pineapple Fever was the pure rush of joy when I realized the episode was over. If the repeated random seizure flashes were removed, I might give this episode a 4, maybe a 5 out of 10. But as is, I personally give this episode an abysmal 2 out of 10. What's our number 2 ultra infamous episode? The Thing. This is not just Squidward's suffering, this is Squidward's worst nightmare. Humiliation? Fear? Resentment? Pain? Injury? I don't know if I've otherwise ever seen Squidward put through so much endless torment in such a short period of time. This time, get this, Spongebob and Patrick are being noisy, horrible neighbours. They interrupt Squidward's quiet evening, force themselves into his house, and then intrude upon him, driving him mad and forcing him to leave his own house to get some peace and quiet. Similar to jellyfishing, this leads to another bike accident as he's covered in cement. And this is not just a one-joke scene. For five days, he's barely shuffling forward, lost, starved, and mummified in the cement. I've been waddling these fields. I'm hungry, tired, and lost. He can't even speak. All we can hear is his moans and screams of pain. Someday, maybe I'll understand this mid-series writing obsession they had with just making Squidward suffer endlessly. And as if Squidward couldn't get any more miserable, we get a further repeat of the storyline of jellyfishing, where Squidward is unable to speak or move while unable to escape Spongebob and Patrick. He's leashed, attacked by Gary, attacked by Patrick, and finally abused and taken by animal control, where he's locked away behind bars in a zoo and is called hideous by viewers. And we're only at the seven minute mark. I desperately wanted the episode to end, but it just kept going. But props to Squidward, he's handling this whole thing with so much stride. After Squidward's been hunted down and carried into the forest by wild animals, he does get five whole seconds of respite where he gets to see his band hero, Kelpie G. This somehow causes him to break out of the cement. It's a good ending. It's a shame it's less than one one hundredth of the episode's runtime. When it comes to what we like, I think we all have our own biases. And for me personally, I seem to be very sensitive to episodes like this, where Squidward is made to suffer endlessly. I don't like it, because to me it's not that funny seeing him miserable. I just want to see him less miserable. And I don't think I'm alone on that. But enough of that. How did this ultra-infamous episode fare among other fans? Well, according to Scumbob, this episode received mostly negative reviews among fans. To get a better feel for this, I looked at the episode's comments on the Spongebob wiki, and I did find some very mixed reactions to the episode. This episode sucks. Abysmal. 18 out of 100. One of the biggest Squidward torture episodes ever. All because he wanted to get away from Spongebob and Patrick's antics. And finally, from Tyler730. Absolutely atrocious episode. In my opinion, this is the first Scumbob episode. Squidward abuse goes way too far. Second worst episode of season four. Somehow Squidward managed to be worse. Ah, that's a segue if I ever heard one. And that brings us to our number one choice. And before we get to number one, just one quick honourable mention. Hide, and then what happens? No, I haven't forgotten that sinking feeling, but this episode has a far more interesting message. Fine, I'll sum up that sinking feeling in one word. 
filler but hide and then what happens? I think this super infamous episode has a much more interesting ending. But the episode starts on a slow burn? No, that would imply actual heat and that something's actually happening. This episode's more like an immobile leisurely stagnation of stupidity. The simplicity of this story is unmatched. SpongeBob invites Patrick to play hide and seek. Yet despite them playing it a thousand times before, Patrick has apparently forgotten how. Gosh! Gosh what? I didn't know hide and seek had so much mathematics. <sighs> Side note, how is this the character they chose to get a spin-off show? There's no depth to the character of Patrick beyond the one-trick joke that he's not bright. Anyway, we get a quarter of the episode dedicated to SpongeBob explaining to Patrick how hide and seek works, followed by SpongeBob searching for Patrick in a game he's not even participating in. So we're essentially just watching SpongeBob play with <laughs> by himself. Yeah, that, that word could have got me black, thank you. But there was one redeeming quality I found in this dull fest in the last minute of runtime. And that's in this interesting sequence where Spongebob finds a drinking bar at the end of the world. And Patrick, not Star, delivers a simple but important message to Spongebob about winning and losing. Did you have fun playing? Yeah. Well, then it's okay to lose, as long as you had fun doing it. It's easy to get lost in a competition sometimes, and it's a nice reminder to hear this every now and then. Anyway, let's move on to number one. Number one. Squidward. Taylor thought this dreck was even worse than The Thing. Well, we'll see about that. SpongeBob starts the episode by committing break and enter into Squidward's house, which sadly is still pretty standard behavior around this series of SpongeBob. Hi Squidward, wanna play? No! He repeatedly nags Squidward to play with him, and obviously Squidward tells him he's not interested. And then I was actually taken aback. Something unexpected happens. It, it seems Spongy finally gets the message. He just leaves. Really? Hmm, what's the catch here? Well, he instead goes and makes a squid puppet. We'll call him Mini Squid. It's me, Mini Squidward. But Mini Squid takes too much of the attention away from Squidward at work, which causes Squidward to get mad at it. Like many fans, I have mixed thoughts on this episode. It's not all bad, because I actually like the chance to hear Tom Kenny do impressions of other characters. I particularly like his Squidward impression. Okay, SpongeBob, always happy to help. <laughs> and as a puppeteer, he gets to do that. And you've got to admire Spongy's fine craftsmanship on his puppet. It's just like a chibi Squidward. And it's good to see Spongebob finally getting the message from Squidward. Sure, it's a little creepy that he turned him into a puppet, but it's something. Honestly, I didn't fully agree with Taylor from before, who said this is worse than the thing. Squidward isn't forced into this situation nearly as much. He willingly gets involved here, and he's not gagged, trapped, attacked, and humiliated repeatedly like last time. And it's not like super sadistic like The Thing, I can still get a chuckle from this. Squidward wasn't grievously injured or crippled, there was no big gross outs, and I wasn't physically revolted by watching it, so I'm ranking it not quite terrible. But what did other people think? I understand why Squidward was so annoyed. I just wanted to punch SpongeBob in the face. No, that wasn't a review. Nin just watched this episode with me and wanted to comment as well. If there's one thing that SpongeBob teaches, it's how to have a crappy friendship. Patrick's a der brain and a crappy friend. Mr. Krabs is a greedy duty brain. And Squidward never wants to play. And I don't blame him. Let's see what the scumbob wiki says. But I'm not done yet, honey. Uh, yeah, but we want to hear from everyone. Can't you tell me what the wiki thinks? Fine, here's what Scumbob Wiki says. There's a very disturbing scene where Spongebob is watching Squidward while he's taking a bath. While he's naked. Really? They think that was disturbing? I thought Spongebob watching Squidward showering was just a standard weekday morning for these two. Everyone is also incredibly stupid in this episode because they believe Mini Squid is real. The customers are also really mean to Squidward. Like when Squidward tells a joke to customers and they give him dirty looks. You know, that's fair. That, that whole joke scene bugged me too. We get a psychological breakthrough for Squidward as he actually tries to joke with customers as he's serving them. And they just glare at him. What the hell? Who has the Krabby Patty, and who has the Krabby Patty? 
Well, I thought it was funny, Squidward. Anyway, Mini Squid apparently becomes a superstar thanks to a talent scout offering the puppet a million dollar contract. Okay. And we then end on 10 straight seconds of SpongeBob repeatedly cackling. Yeah, this nonsensical lunacy is starting to get to me. Let's finish up. If you're curious, there's also a whole library of super infamous Spongebob episodes, many of which I haven't talked about. If you'd like me to cover some of them in the future, or just have some thoughts on these episodes, let me know in the comments. Anyway, thanks for watching and hope to see you next time. <coughs> Today's member question is from Sweet Wolf Steve. They ask, when did you and Nin meet? We actually met online in early 2020. For all of Facebook's problems, I can never completely dismiss it as I met my fiance through it. We're both very transparent, big communicators, and we faced a lot of challenges together. And we're always laughing. And as you've probably noticed, I'd love to have a voice on the channel. And I'll throw voice lines in for any chance I get. It's a purely selfish thing too, because hearing her voice always makes me smile. Thanks for the question.